Right, well, thank you so much. My name is Tom Wimson from Ident Computer. Um, I hope you're having a good time at the show. It's our first time here, so uh, it's all been a bit up in the air, but um, I'm really thrilled to be here in London and I'm thrilled to be able to come and talk to you today. Um, so what I want to go through is a brief introduction to who I am, who we are, and what we do. My work with the BBC Micro and the 8-bit world, which some of you might be surprised uh, what we actually get up to and what we do in that field. Um, the Ident Micro 1 kit computer that some of you may be aware of, and you may be here wanting to know about that. And then also uh, our own version of RISC-RES 5, which we licensed from Castle. And if we have time, we'll do a Q&A session at the end. What I'm going to politely ask is, because we're quite tight on time today, uh, we're going to leave questions to the end. If we don't get time to do a Q&A, you're more than welcome to come talk to myself and my partner and the fellows who's on our stand right by the main entranceway. So without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll make a start. So my name's Tom Wimson. I have a B honours in broadcast production. Uh, and my background was television and radio production, and I worked as a freelance for a number of years uh, for the BBC and independent producers. I still do. Uh, I formed an organisation about 10 years ago called IDET Broadcasting and Communications to make programmes, mainly, mainly radio programmes, and we've had a few um, diversifications over the years, and those included IDET Radio and, more recently, in the past 24 months, IDET Computer. On the uh, topic of Ident Radio, just as a little side note, I currently present and produce a radio show called Wi-Fi Sheep, which is all about um, technology, making, building, gaming, um, quite a wide audience, and it's broadcast on South Waves Radio, which is uh, on the um, sort of Bournemouth area of the South Coast, broadcast online, and we also carry the programme uh, bi-monthly on Ident Radio, which is on soundcloud.com forward slash Ident Radio, uh, we talk a bit about risk of S, but we, we cover a very wide range of subjects. Uh, so this is sort of a project I'm currently doing. I said I'm the main presenter and producer, and we have guests on, etc. to talk about all sorts of different things. So my first introduction to computing was between 1990 and 1992. Yes, I'm actually quite that young. And it was actually with Macintosh. And this was purely because of my father's work in the design industry. He's still a designer, about to retire now. But they were using Macintosh from the mid-80s, so it was natural that we have the machines at home. Uh, and of course, we're not talking the kind of fashionable iVis or I Mac OS X, that. We're talking the original beige box, Motorola 600 series Mac. And that's what I grew up with um, to begin with. That was at home. And then at school, as with many people of my generation, or a little bit older, uh, Acorn computers. Our first introduction to Acorn was at school uh, from 1992 when I started school, and it was BBC Micros and BBC um, Model B and Master. Uh, reason being that um, where I come from, where I is still based, which is Shropshire, um, not a lot of money floating around in that part of the world. So the school's budget, uh, they got the original fleet of BBC Micros in, uh, let's say 86 for argument's sake, around the end of the computer literacy. Uh, program and basically it was said there's your computers and there's no more money you know there's no upgrades nothing that is it so these machines have done about 10 years before I'd started and the BBC Micro in Shropshire did not leave frontline classroom service until 2003 and even when they did manage to bring some PCs in there wasn't enough PCs, or the PCs they bought in weren't good enough, so they had to run them with BBC Micros as well. So you had a scenario where you had a classroom, you had a BBC Micro, and then a, a Wintel Office Windows 3.1 PC, and it actually worked side by side. So for me, I picked up computing just by being absorbed with it at school, and became really interested in the BBC Micro. So something fascinating about these machines. Uh, and I found the one book left in the school library. This is primary school. So it's the end of my time at primary school, so I'm about 10, 9, 10 years old. I found the one book left, which was how to program the BBC Micro. And there was sudden this realisation of, hang on a minute, you can program these things? Because all they were running was a web processor. That was what they were doing, was web processing. There was no taught computer science of any kind at this point. Uh, and I was just like, wow. So I started to pick up how to program, and I just absolutely found all over the machines. So let's roll on a little bit. Um, formation of IDEC Computer. 
Uh, formerly a, a splinter of uh, Ident Broadcasting Communications from 2014. Core aims of Ident Computer, and they're in this order. This is, this is my uh, Reefian moment, for those of you that know the BBC. The, um, it, I can't remember the right order now. Edu inform, educate, entertain, sorry, yeah, that's all there, yeah. Well, mine is preservation, education, and development of products or services, in that order. And with preservation, it's our own fleet of BBC Micros, which started as one computer that I got hold of off eBay two years ago or so, just to kind of rebuild, repair, and have as something I remembered and reconnecting with that time at primary. Uh, and people got wind of I had a BBC Micro, and at this time the Raspberry Pi had come out, and I was doing a lot of what they called a Raspberry Pi Jam events. Now these are computing events set up in schools, colleges, universities, libraries, and anyone can register and come to these events. Most of them are free. And I, I said, oh, I got BBC Micro, and a lot of the organisers went, oh, wow, God, could, you, could you bring that? I was like, what, the BBC Micro? Yeah, 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 bring them over to Micro. Uh, okay, oh. And um, all of a sudden I got organisers of these events, knowing that I don't have the Micro, saying that we'd like a fleet of BBC Micros to come to our event, because it's not for the parents. The parents bring the kids, the kids go and play Minecraft on the Raspberry Pi, and the parents can come and reminisce with the BBC Micros. And it still became quite lucrative. So, as you can see here, the machine's set up um, in schools, etc. Um, that's my partner, Anna. Um, we actually mostly run them with uh, flat screen HD monitors. They've had a slight modification to allow them to run uh, their RGB signals transferred, etc. We've also done things like repaired the capacitors in the units, because those of you who have any um, knowledge of recent BBC Micro will know you, turn, you buy it off eBay or get it out of the attic, you turn it on and it goes bang. It's not a sales pitch, it goes bang. Um, because the capacitors in the power supply have dried out and they tend to blow up and not a nice smoke and maybe a bit of flame and you name it. So we replace all that, uh, give them a good clean, good service, etc. And then they go back out, back into schools, colleges, etc. And then in education, this has happened more recently this year, but I got a call from a school saying, we heard you through a friend of a friend of a friend of the teacher we heard you, you've got BBC Micros, yes. Um, we'd like you to bring them to our school to do a training session with our children on original BBC Micro. And they said, and if possible, we'd like to buy some for the school. And um, yeah, I heard, I heard that in the room. That's exactly what I did. I was like, okay. And do you know what I said, right? Okay, that could have been the easiest sale of the century. But I, I, I had a chat on the phone and I said, are you sure? Because there are newer, better things that will do this. Than, they said, no, 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 we want original, it's very specific, so BBC Micro Model Bs. Now I thought, oh, you, you want one? No, 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 we, we want two. Okay, yeah, well, we can do two. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's fine. So anyway, so it, it transpired that we took two machines down, fully refurbished the spec I've already discussed with you. Uh, the school we're going to keep, and I took two of my own machines down uh, to sort of bolster up the numbers, and took a Micro One, which is a Pi powered machine we'll come to, running in basic mode with Risco S as well. So we then had a room basically full of Acorn computers writing BBC Basic, and we started with, this is primary school kids, these are year six, which are 10 and 11 year olds. And then they did the morning. They actually, the school moved class sessions around. So we had a solid two hours in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we did the year fives. That's the nine to 10 year olds. And even I was starting to say, look, I'm not sure, they, are these kids gonna really, okay, no, we'll do it. And to be fair, they totally got it. And we got them writing basic and doing, you know, draw commands, mode two, colors all that kind of stuff, doing the loops, so they started, and they really enjoyed it, and it was a huge success. And of course what I do is I, I have a, a worksheet that I give to schools and they have some, so they can photocopy, so they can actually carry on using the machines to do, to teach kids basic again. And it's part now of a wider sort of diet of computer code, so they go on to things like Python, on the Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, but it was, it was amazing, it was truly amazing to actually be there and make that happen. So there's now a tiny little primary school in Cardiff, Wales, in a nothing special, 
and they've now got BBC Micros back as part of their computing fleet, which is just amazing. So these are some slides from that day, and we also have a, a fifth machine that went down called Scrappy. All our micros have names, you see, so we can identify who's who. And Scrappy, as you might guess, doesn't actually work. But a nice thing about Scrappy is that we can uh, take it apart. So what we do is we have the kids come into the room, and we show them the BBC Micro, and we say, right, they look at it. First of all, they have alien technology. And I say, right, this is a computer. And I'm like, what? I said, can't go on the internet. What? Doesn't have a mouse. Oh, you know, and it just... After they've finished panicking, I said, right, no, and you're going to learn how to program this. Can't do that. Can't program it. What? Program is complicated. Don't like programming. And, you know, calm down. We're going to do this. And the first thing we need to do is we need to kind of demystify, you know, the magic pixie dust that makes the computer work. So it's really nice to be able to take one apart. I can't break it anymore when it's already broken. So we give them the bits, etc., and we sort of say, look, this is actually what's inside. And then obviously, with Micro One being able to run BBC Basic, we can run the same program on the BBC Micro and the same program on Micro One next to each other, and we can actually show for 35 years between them, there's actually that transition, if you like. So people can then start to relate where the code comes from, how computers work. It's not this sort of mystical thing where you just have to do one set thing and that's it. Um, an advantage of doing this is we actually write our own software. I'm slowly developing my own BBC Micro game. Yes. Called Nano Gangs. It's been announced on a couple of websites, etc. And it's very, very behind because you've got to understand it's a pet project. It won't technically be commercial. So when it's finished, it's going to be a show uh, free release. And I'm writing it just using BASIC for the uh, BBC Model B 32K. So no assembler or anything in there. So it's going to be written purely in BASIC. So you can imagine the challenge involved in that. It'll be a 2D platformer. And what I'm going to do is, when we've done the BBC version, we're going to do a full port all the way, hopefully all the way through the Acorn the clone machines, right into the dev boards, so you'll be able to get a RISC-OS compatible version, an ARPA version, a BBC Micro version. We're going to do it as a freeware, um, well, a shareware, sorry, download, so as long as your BBC Micro, for example, has a way of getting data off the internet and into it, such as an SSD or data drive type system. Um, at a later date, I've got to release the game first, don't get too excited and don't hold me to this, so at a, at a later date, I'm going to do a couple of upgrades with it, and we'll probably do a disc version, a proper printed, limited edition release disc version for collectors and people who would like it on a five and a quarter inch disc, etc. Or a CD-ROM for this PC. So that's kind of where we'll go with that, if there's the interest. But really what I'll do is I'll get this game finished, and I'll get it out there on the market. At the moment, even though it's in a semi-broken state, doesn't work properly, it's great for showing kids, etc., and teachers at, at schools, look, this is a Raspberry Pi running this program, this is a BBC running exactly the same program. And we can go through the code and look and say, look, you can actually do this. You can learn programming and do this. Okay, it's not rocket science, and I'm no way a software engineer. There's people out there that are far, far cleverer than I'll ever be when it comes to computing. But it's about taking that bit of knowledge and packaging it in such a way that it becomes accessible to the masses, and that's a big part of what we do at IDEN. So, the Micro One. Now, the Micro One started life as a project for me. Uh, I'd started going to the Raspberry Pi jams, we started to do a bit of the BBC Micro stuff, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could actually have a BBC Micro computer that was sort of new, not dated, but still had all the inbuilt keyboards and stuff. And I started looking online, thinking, well, what's available? What can you buy? And yeah, there's a couple of products out there, you've probably seen them. Um, but for me, they just didn't look right, or they were very, very expensive, or I just didn't, it didn't sit right with me, and I thought, I could just build one. So, I did, I built one, I got to an A4 box file, I cut it in half, I stuck a keyboard on it, painted it black and red, ran Raspbian, which is a standard Linux distribution, put a Raspberry Pi inside it, and I took it to a show. When I said a show, it was a Raspberry Pi jam, so it was a gathering at a school. No, I didn't think anything of it, you know, I was just there as a sort of con... It wasn't really an exhi exhibitor, that's the wrong word, but people show up with their projects and you show them, etc. And people kept on and says, oh, that's great, where can I buy one from? And I was like, I was like what? 
What? No, that's brilliant. Oh, what can I buy? Will you make me what? I said, it's cardboard. No, that doesn't. Well, I, so, well, no, I, I can't because it's it's not very good. Well, we'll make it better and I'll buy one. Okay, okay, fine. So, bless her, Anna, you've got to go and say hello to on the stand up there. She took my original prototype and redesigned it, made it a lot slimmer, a lot smaller, and we started to build what became the Mark II micro one, what's called the Ident one at that point, out of um, foam board. And then people started buying these computers as prototypes. And I was going, look, you do realise this is made of foam board. Don't care, what one? Okay, great, great. So Mark 2 turned into Mark 3, and then finally got to the point of today, and this year, launching the Mark 4, which is now plastic. The demand got so high that we looked into manufacturing and producing a machine and getting it done in plastic and being more durable, etc. Then coming over to RiscOS, uh, licensing the version of the operating system from Castle and also taking feedback from the community and those people who have bought early prototypes from us, which is why you may have seen one or two machines from us here last year on some other stands. Um, Anthony Bertram down at Amcog, who's I think in that corner today, he was an early um, investor in the project and actually had a machine here at London last year. But one of the feedbacks that came back was people said, oh, you know, we would like a kit. It'd be great if we could actually build it, because originally I was going to build the machines and sell them as you know, ready to go computers. And they were like, no, 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 we buy, buy a kit, great. Okay, great, okay, right. So we now offer it as a kit, a very easy to assemble kit. Everything is in that kit, apart from Raspberry Pi board, power supply, and HDMI. Gear. The reason those three things are taken out is the feedback we kept getting back was people saying, well, I've already got a Raspberry Pi, I've got loads of Raspberry Pi's, I don't want to buy this and have another Raspberry Pi, I just want to use an existing one. And also when we ship some units into Europe, Germany for example, different power system, different socket, so there's no point shipping a three pin plug. People are paying for things they don't want. So we took those items out and we sell them separately. We also listened to the education market, now these are made for people running this with um, Raspberry and Linux or Ubuntu. Uh, they wanted access to the GPIO pins, which is the pins on top of a Pi board. It looks suspiciously like a floppy disk controller, but it's not. It really isn't. It just has the same pinouts. But it's actually for people who want to do breakout electronics projects, etc. Uh, there are modules available for risk rest. They're not included in our operating system, but you can freely download those if you wanted to do breakout electronics, such as LEDs, motors, or control remote devices from your Pi. Uh, it allows you to get access quite simply just by plugging into the top of the machine. The SD card uh, socket, the Pi runs off an SD card. We wanted to be able to change the card to change the OS quite quickly without taking the Pi out. So what we did is this little vent in the side allows you to very neatly slot in and out an SD card with whatever OS you're running. Trim colours. Choice of red, green, and blue. Well, you think it's trivial, but some people are really passionate. No, no, I must have a green one. Okay, yeah, no, we'll do a green one. So, at the moment, the choice is red, green, and blue. As I came into the presentation today, I am aware we still have stocks here at London of all three colours, just, but stocks are very limited today. And in risk Rest 5, I'll do a very brief demonstration shortly. Uh, we've done a slight visual rebrand of OS 5. Um, this build is RiskOS 5.23. It's a late December build from last year. Uh, it is based on um, RiskOS Open's official build. Uh, we've done a few tweaks, a few modules such as key mapper module fitted uh, to allow the use of a copy key uh, for old beeps micro function, etc. And a few other little tweaks like that, which I will come to very shortly. And the rest of it was more a slight visual reskin. You've got to remember the main market I talk to are people who have never heard of Acorn, never heard of RiskOS, and have absolutely no idea. So you appreciate when I come to talk to you all today, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. But a lot of the time I have to take something that could be seen quite inaccessible and put it into a brand new marketplace. And that's quite a challenge. Alternatives. A lot of people think our system is locked to RiskOS. It isn't. It is a standard Pi board at the end of the day. So we recommend Ubuntu Mate if you're running on the Pi 2. Uh, if you're running on anything less, such as uh, an A plus B plus board, or want to run with Pi 3, 
then uh, Pixel, which is the new Raspbian build from Raspberry Pi Foundation, is also very good. And we recommend one of those two if you're looking for a Linux platform as well or instead of. And some people buy our kits and use them for other purposes. So the risk is that they don't care about that. They just want the, the unit as a foundation for another build. And someone built a giant ZX Spectrum out of one and then ran Fuse Emulator uh, on Linux, which is people are very free to do what you want. And that's the thing about our kit. Obviously, we can't give tech support for customized projects but people can use it as a foundation for a much larger build. And I think some people from the Amiga community are using it to rebuild uh, Amiga-based machines as well. So there's, there's a bit of interest in projects going on. Talking of Raspberry Pi boards, officially compatible and will fit our kit is the models A+, B+, Pi 2B, and Pi 3B will fit but we haven't, our OS isn't fully updated to work. There are some compatibility issues. You should probably know about this. Uh, it is possible to make it work. We don't officially support it, and we haven't physically tested our distribution enough yet. We know it's not stable on Pi 3 at the moment, but people can tweak and get it to work. Or you can use a fresh OS from uh, Wisconsin Open, etc., and or a, a Linux distro will work absolutely fine. Boards not compatible. Original 2012-2011 models A and B do not fit, Pi Zero does not fit, and the compute modules don't fit. With Pi Zero, our OS will actually run on it. It is possible if you wanted to take a drill to a kit, you could get it inside, but you then need to have all the adapters to adapt it up from micro USB, mini HDMI, to full size standards to plug anything in. We don't support it, we don't, there's enough space in there. Some people might make it work, so it's up to you, but officially we don't support Pi Zero. If you want to buy online, you can buy in confidence from island-online.co.uk forward slash computer and you can click on the Ident1 web page and there's a buy it now shop section. This uses PayPal, so we don't deal or handle with any of your credit or debit card details. It's all a safe, secure system. Uh, do bear in mind there's an admin charge and posting packaging apply if buying online. Prices are clearly listed for European and UK uh, sales. Anyone internationally would need to contact us and we'd arrange carrier separately. And the prices. Now these are the prices today at the show, if you're interested. The kit is now £115. As I said, it doesn't contain a Raspberry Pi, HDMI lead or a power supply. Those items we supply in an additional kit which is additional £55 and is only available to people purchasing the main kit today. So for £170, you can take away an entire kit, build it over a weekend, you can have a risk os based micro one machine. For those who would like us to build the main kits for them and supply a pre-built unit that you fit your own Pi inside, pre-built start from £145, you'll need to contact us directly Bear in mind that, uh, again, postal admin charges will apply on top of that and we will negotiate on a one-to-one -one level with a customer wishing to do that. So these are the prices that are valid today. We can't promise we can hold prices into next year. A lot of our stock um, components are bought in from overseas, weak pound, etc. Uh, the plastics are actually done here in London and then sent back up to where we are in Shropshire, so they should stay relatively stable. If we can keep the price stable, we will do the best we can. My personal goal would be to try and get a little bit lower. We, when we launched in the summer, the kit was 165, and we renegotiated with our suppliers and put it down to 115, which we think is a fantastic price. Um, you've got to understand the market we're in. People don't want to spend lots and lots of money on an OS or something they're not sure about, but they like the idea of a microphone, but it's sort of cheap enough and accessible enough. It's a fun project for people to do, and that's kind of where we see the micro one being placed. So see it as a a replacement for an ailing Archimedes or a Ropiris PC, or as maybe a secondary computer to your main uh, risk arrest desktop system, etc. Um, but it's mainly it's the hobbyist market that we, we sell into. So what I want to do now is just show you some brief alterations to the operating system itself. There we go. By the way, that um, presentation engine, not the presentation itself, but the actual program running it, was kindly uh, sent to me by Rob Sproson of uh, Titanium Board fame. I uh, met Rob when he was doing the talk at the Midland Group, and he was running this clicking slide presentation. I thought, that'd be fantastic. And he very kindly sent me the raw basic code to do that, so I'm indebted to Rob for sharing that with me. 
Uh, right, this is our build of Risk OS 5. Uh, I'm running it in a 4 3 aspect ratio. It will boot in a widescreen ratio as standard. Uh, you can set it to what you need, etc. Um, first thing I want to show you is a basic app. This is custom to us. This is the world's most simplest app. And I can't believe no one else has done this. And before you say, what well, a Pico distribution does this, I know, but it's nice to have the ability to double click and the machine boots. It launches its basic interpreter and launches it looks like a BBC Micro. Now that's fantastic if you're running in a room with BBC Micros. You can run these machines side by side, put the same basic code in. Uh, it's very useful. It's just a nice little feature to have. And also those who are wanting to, to buy a machine to, for nostalgic purposes to reminisce about a BBC Micro, but don't want a BBC Micro, things like this are kind of ideal. It's just such a simple little app that we put on our build. Obviously to get out of that, it's a simple asterisk and quit. We can tap out. Um, things like uh, StrongEd have been updated, as has NetSurf. Our version, when you load, will actually go straight to the IDN computer website. Now, there was a few comments on one or two forums, etc., which I actually missed until quite late. People saying our stuff didn't work on NetSurf. And if we're a risk arrest company, etc., it's ridiculous, blah, 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 our site isn't right. What you need to do is run the latest version of NetSurf, if you can, and you need to turn JavaScript on. Our website uses a JavaScript content engine, so if you still can't find JavaScript, it can't actually put any content on the pages, which is what was happening. As you can see here, I'll just go full screen for you. As you can see here, it's running, that's NetSurf, it's running more than fine, and it's really the case of going down to your choices and on content, and just making sure that your disabled JavaScript tip box is actually unticked. Set that, you've now got JavaScript, which now opens up another 80% of the world's internet to you. So it was a struggle actually when it wasn't supporting JavaScript at all. So I highly recommend uh, doing that. Our version, well I say our version, the version loaded on here does do that automatically. It also loads our site automatically, etc. Okay, um, one sort of final thing I'll show you, and again, some we put on our distribution, is emulators. Now, this is because a lot of the marketplace uh, we sell to want to run old games, old software, BBC micro disc images, etc. So what we've done is, where possible, we've put together a selection of um, freely available uh, public domain emulators and software, etc. A lot of these will require what, uh, ROMs. Um, we can't, because of licensing, we can't issue the ROMs. The ROMs are freely available. You can, if you have ROMs and licenses, you can simply transfer them across. How you get the ROMs, it's totally up to you. I'm not going to say go and Google search them, but you can do what you need to do to get them. Um, we have, for ZX Spectrum fans, Fuse Emulator, so you can actually run your ZX Spectrum tape images, disk images, etc. Um, and that, that will work without a ROM, because the ROM is embedded in the code. Uh, BBIT is the BBC Micro emulator for running uh, SSD disk images. You'll need the ROMs for that, they're available from, from the author's website, and you simply shift click the pling and fit them inside the ROM folder, etc. We issue a version of DOSBox, which I will boot for you. Um, that allows you to obviously for earlier PC applications and the two machines in the lobby actually have a version of Windows 3.1 running. Now this is quite useful for those of you that maybe are running older hardware with uh, PC modules fitted and maybe are running a kind of a Windows 3.195 system for various reasons. We have met people who have various databases running on their SPCs and need that uh, PC compatibility. This is actually quite good and may actually be able to replace that function for you. If you need it for serial ports or things, it won't, because the Micron doesn't support serial SCSI, etc. It's purely a USB flash-based system. But if it's purely a software solution, this might work for you. Uh, but to do it, you'll need at least a Pi 2 board, because it does need a bit of power, and you may need to overclock to maybe 1 gigahertz. The standard for a Pi 2 to run at is 900 megahertz. So I won't, can't demonstrate much on here, because today this is running on a, a A-plus board, 
uh, which is only running at 700 megahertz and is a little bit too slow to actually run any past the command prompt. So finally, the last thing I'm going to show you today is Acorn 26-bit. Now, one of the big problems, uh, and you may be aware of Postgres 5, is it doesn't support 26-bit software. It can only run 32-bit compiled code. So one of the solutions, and there's many solutions, some people, there's various bits of software, some free, some commercial, some don't work that well, I've had problems with, and I didn't want to ship with my version OS, knowing this could happen. So we found a solution was to run Arkem, and again, you need a RISC OS uh, 10 or RISC OS 3, sorry, RISC OS 3.10 or 3.11 um, ROM image. And it's a simple case of double clicking. Now this is a tiny bit slow because I've actually added a separate boot directory to this. So it's actually going to boot, reboot up again and it will actually then boot into the Archimedes style RISCRESS 3.10. And this will now allow you to run most of your earlier late 80s to mid 90s RISCRESS 26-bit software. So Again, you have to excuse me, we are running a slightly slow machine and I've slowed it down even further. You can just run this purely with the ROM image and it will load in a few seconds. But as you see, I've got to build myself a full blown desktop. Um, a folder called HostFS, which is here. HostFS links to a folder called HostFS within Viscress 5. I can then run things, so for example, Elite. There we go, runs fluidly. It's mainly there for people who are going to run games, but if you've got earlier software that can run within the Archimedes framework, then it, this will be fine for you. It's a few tweaks, mainly with color palettes, but software-wise, it's actually been quite stable, quite solid. So again, I'm just going to uh, F12 out of that. So when we're done, Again, you can customise this to have a complete Archimedes engine. You can actually get this to automatically boot when you turn the machine on. So it will boot RiskOS 5, then it will boot the emulator on top. So those of you that actually want to recreate an Archimedes and run the RiskOS 3, this is an ideal solution with Micro 1. If I want to leave, it's a simple case of Alt and Break. And it will break the program, etc. like so. So that fundamentally is uh, the Micro One project, that's IDEC Computer, and this is our build of Viscous 5. So I think we've got a little bit of time. Five minutes. We've got five minutes. I can take a couple of questions in five minutes. Yes, sir? Why do you think Briscoff and BBC have come back into both in education? I think it's mainly to do with, um, first of all, the Raspberry Pi sort of reigniting that idea of sort of, oh yeah, I remember that. Computers used to be able to program with a flashing prompt. There's a change, I don't know if you're aware about this, sir, but there's a change in the um, uh, education sector. The government took out ICT, which was data entry, PowerPoint, Microsoft, and replaced it with computer science. Suddenly this idea that kids had to learn how to code, what do people remember, BBC Micros, etc. Then the BBC launched something called the BBC Micro Bit, which other than the name didn't really have anything to do with the BBC Micro, it was more a, a controller board that plugged via USB into a Microsoft powered web application on a tablet and flashed a bit. But basically it brought that back into fashion. A lot of people then suddenly remembered, oh, I remember BBC Micros from the 80s or whatever, they were great weren't they? So the whole thing kind of suddenly became fashionable and nostalgic at the same time. Whether that's good for going forward, I don't know, but at the moment, that's where I think it is kind of, it's fashionable, etc. to be there. And you know, for people like myself, I suddenly wanted to build something for me that was useful to me, and other people just really picked up on that, which is, you know, fantastic. Okay, uh, yes? Yes. We looked at doing it, um, we might. I think I've got very limited, we have very limited production runs, oh, yeah. so it's, it's, it's getting units yeah. out there, etc. So, uh, but to be honest, there's nothing to stop you with a few cans of beige spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a ZX Spectrum out there, you know, we'll mock up one, so it's very customizable. You can change and repaint what you want. We may look at doing sort of limited edition runs in the future, if there's demand, we'll see. Uh, well, gentlemen, if I call. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you I only came halfway through, and you okay. talked a lot about how it works. 
Have you actually written that down? Or, I mean, your talk is available because I can't remember. My talk will, will be on that video camera right there on YouTube. So anything I say and then later live to regret but will you be. <laughs> you haven't written the manual. Uh, well, we, the, the kit does have an instruction sheet of how to put it together, etc. Uh, no, the only sort of copy of this talk, etc. is unless you'd like my notes, but they're sort of you might want to spell check them for me first. But you know, uh, but no, really, the best thing to do would be to watch it on the video feed afterwards. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, here. Yeah. How easy is it to assemble the kit? Is there any soldering or anything? No, there? no. There's, it's purely it's an internal USB fit. So you just clip together the internals inside and it is purely super glue. So what we tell people is test fit the components. You don't have to cut any components, it's just test fit the components. Take the film, plastic films off the plastic, make sure it fits, make sure it's square, two blobs of super glue, stick, stick, etc. And then there's um, some uh, screw bolt mounts that you can then bolt to the uh, pie board in. It allows you to take the pie board and upgrade the boards and change out to what you need, etc. But no, you don't need any electronics experience, um, no soldering, anything like that. Purely a little bit of gluing. So what I say to people is if you're confident enough to build a, sort of base, a basic Airfix kit, you can put one of these together. Um, we've had several people, you know, I say more than several now, that we've sold to. Uh, one chap in Germany, we, I shipped the unit out to him. Four days later, he posted on the Facebook groups a completely finished built machine. I was like, when you sent that to you four days ago, you know? <laughs> so, um, no, there's not a problem. There's instruction sheet that we give you, and there's also additional instructions uh, on the website as well, including uh, large versions of the diagrams, etc. But again, if you'd like to come and have a look at the kit itself, we've got a box that people can actually open and have a look, and I'll can go in more detail about how it goes together, etc. Okay, I think, are we just about... Is the software available separately? No, the soft, um, obviously risk Rest 5 is available separately as a download um, for free for the Risk of 5. The bits of software that I've shown you, with the exception of Basic App, you can download, you can get hold of, etc. They're freeware, public domain releases. A lot of it we bought together, etc. Uh, the tools we need, mainly for the education market that we sell these units into. Uh, but no, unfortunately our distribution, because of the way we licensed it with Castle, it is purely for the Micro One kit. So there's an SD card? There's an SD card with the kit, yes, yes. But we can't be uh, sort of freely distributing our version because it would be slightly problematic <coughs> if there's sort of other sort of phantom versions of Risk OS going on out there. And it's, not, it's, it's best for people that want the OS for sort of standard pie boards to get it from the official source. We'll do our version, specific for our kit, and then we'll update from the official source, etc. And I think that's probably the healthier way, also for the risk risk community market as a whole, to do that. So we're not kind of creating a scenario like many of you maybe were a few years ago with multiple versions tramping over each other. And you know, at the end of the day, we are kind of secondary to the main build from the all, etc. We've just tweaked it and modified it for our needs. But again, you could create this yourself from freeware if you've got the time and patience to do it. Okay, I think that's more or less it. So I'll say thank you so much for uh, your time. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I said stocks are very limited today. Uh, we don't carry a lot of stock. Anna is up the top there. So when I came in, we had all three versions, uh, trim colours still available. Any further questions or anything you'd like to look at, simply do come and find me in the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, thank you very much.